This is the Rising Tide Startups Podcast, where we chat with startup founders from all over the globe to help you escape the cubicle and begin your own startup journey. Make sure you take notes. Every episode of Rising Tide Startups is sponsored by Podbrand Media. Let Podbrand create and host your company branded podcast. Learn more at podbrandmedia.com. This is Kevin Pruitt with another episode of Rising Tide Startups, and I have a very special guest with me today, Dana Lindahl. Dana, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me on here. Really glad to be here. So before we hit the uh, big red record button, we were chatting a little bit, and I said, you know, I don't have very many people that are kind of in the podcast booking space on the podcast as a, as an interviewee. And so this is like the flip side of what I do. So I, I mean, I, I met... It is, it is all my fault. I should have had many, many more of you guys on this call. But um, the thing that really stood out about Dana was just the activity and the, the service that, that, that their service provided to this podcast. So I'm just grateful enough that as I just reached out to the, the last person that, that contacted me about a guest and said, you know, I said, Kate, can your founder come on, come on this podcast and, and share kind of the story and the backstory and, and really uh, just talk about, you know, podcast guesting as a whole. But before we kind of really jump into this, Dana, just if you and I met at like a networking event, how would you introduce yourself to me? Uh, probably very loudly and enthusiastically. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of my style. Uh no, uh, my name is Dana. Uh, my background is actually uh, in lead generation. So uh, I started a version of the company that I run now by starting an outbound outreach company, uh, primarily for B2B companies to help them set sales appointments. And anyone who works in B2B now knows that there's a million of these companies squared uh, that exist now that are bombarding your inbox yeah. every day, trying to get you to sign up for their services. And it was the huge influx of these other sort of companies that just caused us to take a look at the market. And it wasn't that, oh no, we have too much competition. We can't really compete with any of these people. It was more like, I'm not sure I want to still play in the space anymore. And my team and I, we had spent a long time, years, several years, close to a decade of really refining our skill set, which was how to find anybody's email address, how to reach out with something very compelling, and how to personalize our emails at scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has turned into the pivot that we've now uh, pivoted the company into, into a podcasting company. So we've taken that same skill set. And I like to joke that since we're no longer a sales legion company, that we're now using our skills for good rather than evil. Uh, but <laughs> change the my, color of the cape. <laughs> my real opinion, though, is that if you're running sales legion campaigns and you're doing them well and you have a quality product that you're helping the people that you're reaching out to. So it's only a joke. <laughs> I, I get it. And so it's interesting. Go back. You know, let's get in the way back machine here and go back a bit and say, you know, who nobody wakes up and says, you know, I'm just going to get into lead gen marketing here. So outbound. So what was that kind of initial foray into the space? I mean, how did you go from, you know, playing online games to doing what you're doing today? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's funny. I was actually just telling this story to somebody yesterday. Uh, I was in a mastermind with a bunch of people. I actually, I used to travel a lot. I used to live abroad. So I was, I was actually in the Philippines of all places. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were some guys, they, they now run a company called the empire flippers buying and selling yeah. businesses. And yeah. so good Maybe. friends of mine, they were running a, a mastermind and I got beat up in this mastermind because <laughs> I didn't actually have a business. I was a freelancer. I was a freelance mm -hmm. writer. And, you know, they've been telling me like, you don't have a real business. Why are you even here? They did invite me, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was a tough mastermind, but there was one guy in the mastermind and he said, okay, Dana, you're, you're a writer, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, what do you want to write about? And I said, uh, I don't know. And he said, okay, so you don't want to be a writer. And it just kind of blew my mind in that instant. And I realized that he was right. And he said, what you need to do is you need to pair your writing skills with another marketable service. And that's, what's going to bring you, you know, success. That's what's going to actually help you to start the business out of this. And I was young. I was maybe 23 at the time when all this was was happening. And that's how I ended up starting a cold email company was mm. I knew how to do good copy, but I needed to find another marketable thing to, to pair it with because simply trying to sell copy to people. I mean, there's a bunch of great copywriters out there who have built mm -hmm. fantastic careers. 
off of it, but I wanted to build something larger than simply being a copywriter. Uh, so that's how I stumbled upon this and started building out a team around things like that. And then eventually realized that I wanted to branch out from that industry. And we made a very advantageous move at the time that we did because we pivoted to being a podcasting company at the end of 2019. Yeah, great time. Just a few months before the whole world took content mm -hmm. creation online and remote. Great timing. And I mean, being in the Philippines, did you utilize VA services as well at that at that time? Or how did that how did that come into play, you know, in so, kind of starting your company? So at that time, uh, when I was actually there, no, I was a I was a freelancer at that time. So I was not using anybody. In fact, that was one of the the points of contention in the mastermind was they asked me, what are your expenses? And I said, I don't have any. And they said, well, you don't have a real business. And I, I was, I was really frustrated. <laughs> um, but no, that was, they were in that sense, they were right. Um, I'd been living at the time in, in Southeast Asia already. So mm -hmm. at the age of 21, I, I moved to Bali. Uh, mm -hmm. it was 2008. The economy yep. was, was tanking in the U S I was a young kid. I didn't know what I was doing yet. I figured I could be broke living in California, or I had a friend invited me out to Bali. Absolutely, I might as well be broke over there and, yep. and try out life over there. Uh, so I've been living there for quite a while. I built a, you know, a pretty good life for myself. The, the freelance thing was working pretty well for me and I was still just a young guy. So, uh, you know, even though I wasn't making that much money, I was making a little bit more money than I was making in the U.S. in a place where and I went a lot farther. third of the expenses, you exactly. know, where you would be in California. So my wife and I, uh, she was my girlfriend at the time. My wife is from Bali. And uh, we were traveling a lot around Asia. And we were just, we were spending a few months in the Philippines because I knew some people there, the guys from the Empire Flippers, along mm -hmm. with, with some other people. Um, I did shortly after that hire several people. In the Philippines, when I launched the the lead gen company in the beginning, I actually hired a number of people pre revenue, basically, right? Uh, because I realized I had an idea, and I started you know running some of these outbound campaigns for myself, and it was working. It was working really well. But I, you know, in the very 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 beginning of this, me as a young guy with an idea, I was trolling the internet and actually finding people's emails myself, mm -hmm. you know, and this is, you know, you, you can find somebody to do this work for a very, very, very low rate these yep. days, if not just have AI do it for you completely. Uh, but I was doing that stuff myself back then, just because I was trying to, to validate an idea. Once I realized it was starting to work and I was setting up sales calls for myself and I was actually getting people who wanted to buy what I did because I was demonstrating that it worked because it worked on them. And, and by the way, this was over 10 years ago, I would get people who would come on the phone and they would say, wait, you run a company that will run a cold email campaign for me mm -hmm. and get me the leads. I've never heard of that before. And <laughs> now you can't find a person <laughs> who yep. is in B2B who hasn't heard of a company who right. emailed them within the past week to do that for them. That is um, crazy. And so I, I started this company. I started to get people who were were interested in it. And I knew that I needed to go out and, and hire people to help me do it. So I hired, I think, three people. Uh, I, I wasn't pre-revenue, I guess, because I had a couple of people who had signed up to, mm -hmm. for the service already. And maybe a little carryover uh, copywriting money, you know? Yeah, exactly. And so I, to say it was pre-revenue, but I believe that the, the first month's salary of these three people was exceeding what I had brought in for the company already. <laughs> and But I just knew that I was, I was onto something and that I wasn't going to make it if I just tried to do everything mm -hmm. myself. So in that sense, I feel like I, I've avoided a lot of the common entrepreneurial mistakes while well, making a lot of the other ones. But at least this one <laughs> common right. one I avoided, yeah, which was that I, I didn't try to do everything myself from the very beginning because... In reality, I don't actually want to do anything. I want mm -hmm. to delegate and I want to strategize and I want to, yeah. you know, come up with ideas, but I don't want to actually do anything. I end up having to do some things mm -hmm. sometimes, of course, we all do. But from the very beginning, I've always been very focused on getting things off of my plate and onto the plate of somebody else who could handle them most likely better than I would. It, and it makes sense. I mean, it, and it's not just the matter of, you know, kind of the, the e-myth idea that says, you know, work on your business instead of in it type thing, but it's also, I mean, I'm an old geezer, so it's it's also this this desire to develop people. You know, I want to I want to spend my time, you know, helping people develop, helping people reach their goals, you know, through whatever this endeavor, you know, it is that we've created. So, you know, I got a couple of people working for me, and I'm like saying, 
guys, I don't look at you like an employee. I look at you like a partner in this. I mean, we are, we are partnering together to make this work, you know, and if it works for me, it's going to work for you, you know, type things. So um, I, I love the idea of, you know, just, it's, it's interesting. You, you know, you started and almost created the hunger from, from month one, you know, saying, Hey, I want to spend more than I'm bringing in. And that's going to be the, my driving force to get me out of bed in the morning. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was definitely scary as I was doing it. Cause I was going from a place of literally having no expenses. So, you know, everything that came in, I could keep, mm-hmm. but it was actually a great mindset shift for me to go from being a freelancer to, to being a business owner, because I had to go, well, I can't keep all this money anymore. No. It's not all profit. I have to, I actually have expenses now. So it was a big shift, but it was the right shift that I needed at the right time. Well, and, and I mean, it's, it's interesting. You said uh, I didn't make that mistake, but I made a lot of others, but it's <laughs> the, the whole idea that, you know, it's, you know, it, are you failing forward? You know, are you pivoting positively, you know, type thing and, and learning from those lessons. But um, I'm, I'm really curious about the transition, you know, when you, when you did pivot, you know, you, the focus of the company pivoted from just this cold outbound to really drilling down in the podcasting space. Why, why did you make that move? What was the impetus for focusing on podcasting? So we had a partner that we had been working with already uh, for podcast placements. So we had already been selling it as an upsell to our our lead gen mm-hmm. services. So we were doing a lot at the time on on LinkedIn. Um, a part of our LinkedIn lead gen service at that time was also doing uh, some thought leader content where we would interview the the CEOs of the company and then turn that into content that we've right. written and also book them onto podcasts as well. Uh, and it was going all right. We had the partner um, towards the end of 2019. I'm not sure exactly what happened with the partner, but they weren't fulfilling in the same way that they used mm-hmm. to. And of course, this is causing problems for for our customers. And yeah. we had a, a meeting on it internally of well, what do we do? Should we look for a new partner? And somebody on the team had said, Dana, this is this is exactly our skill set that we do already. It's it's probably even easier than mm-hmm. what we're trying to do for our customers already. We don't need a new partner. We just need to do this. Yeah. And I was initially resistant to the idea mm-hmm. just because, you know, when you have an idea in your head of this is what we need to do and someone presents you with something different, it yep. takes sometimes a little bit of time to be like, yep. wait. And yep. then it, I realized like this person has the exact right idea. We can absolutely do this. And it wasn't an overnight switch. Uh, and I didn't switch the team. We kept the whole same team. So for a while we were running with, you know, two different websites and two different, mm-hmm. you know, I had two different emails and, you know, there were some customers at the Legion company that had no idea about the podcasting company right. and vice versa. There were some that were, were both. And then a really powerful moment happened for me at the beginning of last year, when I changed the homepage of the lead gen site to not redirect to the, our new site, but to. Uh, just have a message that says, hey, this is our new project and go mm-hmm. over there if you want to learn more about it. Uh, because it really meant that I was was all in on the new yeah, project. And, the and boats. Prior, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and prior to that, it was always like, you know, people would reach out, yeah, hey, we can still help you out on this. And it was distracting mm-hmm. us away from building out mm-hmm. the business that we we really wanted to build. And I will say one of the things that I, I love about the business that I run now compared to how we were running it before, which a lot of it is exactly the same skill set, is before we would have a customer come on, they want to reach out to this type of person. So we go, we build them a list. We set up email accounts for them. We, we reach out on their behalf and, you know, we do that the next week. If we have another customer come on exact same type of company, exact same type of targeting, exact same, everything, just a different company. We can't really reuse any of the the leads. I mean, we could, if we were unethical, we could take the same lead list mm-hmm. and send it again. But even if we did that, we would never be able to draw on the relevance that we've already created between these companies. You know, I can't reach out as a second company and say, Hey, do you remember we reached out as a different company last week? And yep. you know, would you like to get on a sales call with this company? Mm-hmm. No, it just doesn't work in that mm-hmm. way, but it does in the podcasting industry when we're placing people as guests. So, you know, Placing somebody onto a show has now started a relationship with that mm-hmm. show. Right. And we are now able to place more of our customers onto that show. And in fact, it's going to be easier to place more of our customers onto that show because the host has come to realize that we understand what they're looking for. Our guests are high quality. And 
it's going to be easier. So it's mm -hmm. it's more of a relationship based business using cold email and using good outbound practices rather than simply being good at outbound practices. So that's the one thing that I love. We're not starting from scratch from every campaign that we run. We are able to draw upon past successes to create more wins for ourselves in the future. And now here's a quick word from one of our new sponsors on Rising Tide Startups. Have you been wanting to start a podcast but not sure where to start? Well, now you can start a podcast in less than 24 hours. I'm David Ezel, and I'll walk you through all of the things that you need to get started today. Things like how to choose the right microphone, how to edit your audio, and how to find guests and build a pipeline of future guests. This course does a great job of keeping things high level while also diving into the things that keep most people from starting. Even better, if you use the code RISING at checkout, you'll get 20% off your purchase. But that's only if you use the code RISING at checkout. What are you waiting for? Start your podcast today. Are you using this, this strategy within for the guest booking services? What are the what's the next step? What's the, what's the output of, of the booking itself? Are you also using that content and kind of slicing and dicing it and using it for additional, you know, marketing purposes, or is that up to the guest or how does, how does your company operate specifically so that, in that? That output? is on our roadmap. Um, it's not something that we're, we're currently offering to people right now. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a, a current graphic design or even you know i for it on the team which is why i want to make sure before we launch it we want to get somebody on who's gonna right. you know help us do it the right way um it's interesting though because oftentimes our customers will will ask us about this or not usually ask us if we can do it for them It'd be great if they could ask if they asked us if we could do it for them we probably would have launched the service if we were getting more <laughs> requests for it <laughs> um but we'll often get people asking us, hey, can you get in touch with the host and get me some of the materials or get the recording or, mm -hmm. or things like that? And we always tell our customers, sure, we'll, we'll be more than happy to do that. But I really recommend that you do that because mm -hmm. you've just spent you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour talking with this host. This host runs a podcast that's very relevant to your industry. They probably know a lot of people in your industry that you could be introduced to. I would not be you know, brushing off any possibility to continue mm -hmm. the interaction with them. Yep. Every touch point is valuable, even if you're not, you know, looking for new customers or, or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, that's a valuable relationship. And that's one of the things that I think uh, people are not focused on enough when they're going on podcasting tours is that the people that they're meeting along the way, podcast hosts tend to be super connectors. They tend to have mm. huge networks just mm -hmm. because of how many people they talk to on a, yep. on a monthly basis. And so I'm a little conflicted in that in that I, I definitely want to be doing this. I definitely want to be selling this as an additional service to our, our customer base. And I think that they would like it and appreciate it. There is a part of me that feels like I would be not robbing them of the opportunity, but getting in between them and the opportunity mm -hmm. to continue to, you know, form this relationship with the host. So I think mm -hmm. probably there's something in there where we can launch something like this, but also be encouraging our customers to treat these relationships as exactly that. Yeah, there, there is no doubt. And I, and I, I really like the way you're thinking in that respect about the, you know, the, the relationship development and just the tapping into that network of the host, because you're right. I mean, I, mine's a relatively small, you know, podcast, but it's, it's amazing how many people that I can email and they would respond because of them coming on the show or because of, you know, contacts we've made. But um, is there a, a learning curve to, you know, when you're reaching out to people that, and you're saying, Hey, we can get you booked on podcast. Do you have to educate them first about the, the potential of this marketing channel or are you starting to see, you know, most people get it already. I don't have to, you know, really kind of educate them and, you know, about the the option before they consider it. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, as as things become more popular and ubiquitous in the world, there's mm -hmm. always going to be the people who still need to be educated on, yeah, you know, the certain, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. So, I mean, it's definitely getting easier uh, compared to a couple of years ago because, a couple of years ago, the common question is, why would I even want to do this? Or, you know, what, what's the benefit to me? And they weren't seeing it. Now people get the benefit 
for the most part. Mm -hmm. The thing is, there's a lot of intangible benefits that that come along with podcasting that people don't realize as well. And it's it's a little bit frustrating because in podcasting, it's very hard to track attribution. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you think about the way that you listen to a podcast, you you hear it while you're driving or at the gym, maybe you make a mental note to look this person up when you get home and you do, and it doesn't get tied back to the podcast right. in, in any way. Um, but we've seen some really cool results from our customers that, I mean, in theory, I guess we can't fully prove them, but we've seen it happen enough times over and over and over again to notice the pattern, which is when people come on, usually around six months after having started to work with us and booking a decent number of podcasts, people will tend to tell us that they see their sales cycle shortening hmm. and they don't know why. Mm -hmm. And at first we didn't know why either. We just, a few people were telling it to us and we're like, oh, that's great. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. We are also starting to have people tell us around nine months in or so, the quality of customer that they're getting in is just working with them so much better. So after we started hearing this enough times, we started down a, I guess, an unscientific process to prove something that we couldn't actually prove. Yeah. Uh, so the opposite of the scientific method. And <laughs> What we came away with is that, and I'm a big fan of the the concept of the B2, the modern B two B buyers journey, which mm -hmm. is that buyers are doing their research outside of the help of of sales reps these days. Mm -hmm. They're they're doing their research offline. They're they're interacting with sales reps, basically just do the deal or ask any clarifying questions. And this means I forget what exactly what the old adage is, but it's like you know a prospect will spend two hours with you across seven touch points before they actually make the decision. And the numbers are wrong, but the the, the point is All right mostly Love there. To, yeah. And uh, but what's happening now is prospects are spending this time asynchronously by you know listening to mm -hmm. you know executives from these companies talk on podcasts, doing their own research and in other ways. So they're coming on to sales calls already basically knowing what they want to do, mm -hmm. but just making sure that a couple of their concerns are taken care of. So to the sales team, who's maybe not that in depth with the fact that, you know, one of the founders is going on podcasts all the time now, yep. and that it's a big marketing push within the marketing department. All he sees is, wow, sales cycles, you know, they've shortened by about 30% over the past six months. This is great. I'm doing awesome. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a number of things that's happening as well as customers come on and they work with companies a little bit better because they're coming on because they actually like what they're hearing. They, mm -hmm. they, they feel aligned with the way that the company does things. And, and they trust there's a, there's almost an inherent trust. Yeah. They're willing to treat the company as an expert because that's mm -hmm. why they've hired them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've, we even had a company that we worked with a couple of years ago that was using our services for a very, very interesting use case, which was they were going on, they're having their executive team go on, non-business focused podcast to talk about their hobbies and interests because they wanted to attract better talent and they wanted to attract mm -hmm. people who would be looking them up and see their executive team as more three-dimensional than just the yep. industry that they're they're in so i feel like there's there's just so many intangible benefits that people don't even really consider when it comes to podcasting because oftentimes people are very you know concerned with well, what's the roi mm -hmm. and that is know, the question and, and it's and very that's hard to prove. You hear all the time. That's exactly you know? right. And and being in sales, it's it's a hard question to answer because I get why you're asking it. You get why I can't tell you an exact number, but sometimes we end up in a stalemate because there's people who get it and they're like, oh, I, I understand exactly. It's it's not gonna, it's it's content marketing, it's a long-term mm -hmm. play. Mm -hmm. And then there's people who oh, it's I can't, you know, I can't prove the ROI on this. It yeah. it doesn't make sense to me. A lot of outbound marketing kind of has that. That I mean, it, it, or, or at least content marketing, I guess, has that that problem. You yeah, know, the, uh, the whole idea that says this is this is a long play. You know, I you can't just do this for a month and quit and expect mm -hmm. you know your sales to increase by twenty five percent. It's like uh, as you were talking, I'm thinking it's like anecdotally attributional. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's just yeah. a, some some weird combination. And another common one that we get, even still, uh, where we're having to to educate people on the podcasting space is a lot of people believe that they'll be they'll be compensated directly mm -hmm. by the show for mm -hmm. for having gone on. And the thing that we always tell people is like, no, this is actually a lot more like TV, where mm -hmm. when you go on TV, you go on, you know, Good Morning America, The Morning Show, or or something like this, the news, they're not paying you. Mm -hmm. They're providing you with an audience 
Yep. And the platform to say whatever it is that, that you want to say, but you are not going to get paid by the TV station for going on. And it's largely the same for podcasting. Mm -hmm. And we always tell people who are looking for paid speaking appearances, what you're looking for is, is keynotes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, and it is like, I mean, you're, you're stepping into their network as well. I mean, every, every podcast that you go into, you're stepping into their network and it is just kind of this honeycomb effect. You know, you're kind of adding network upon network upon network. But the one, one thing that I, I noticed by, you know, interviewing, you know, 300 founders from 30 different countries that, that it's interesting. They, they tended to go from like podcast to podcast and there were the same general set of questions you know, that, that they were asked often, especially podcasts that were in the same space. If you're in the startup build, you know, business marketing space, you're asked the same general set of questions. And there was never an opportunity for these founders to really go deep. You know, how do you, how do you have a repetitive opportunity, you know, on a podcast, you know, versus this kind of one-off, this kind of shotgun approach. And, and, it, it is three-dimensional. It's not just two-dimensional. And, and I'm starting to see this, this other phase where they're, they're like creating their own podcasts, you know, so they are the continual guests or they're, they have somebody hosted forum type thing. I've also seen them, seen podcasts used as lead generation sources where you're interviewing potential clients, you know, um, and to create good content in a marketing space. So, Talk about kind of the different dimensions. I mean, is are any of these kind of in the 2.0 version of your of your company or 3.0? Are you looking at, you know, look kind of project out 18 months to 36 months? What does it look like? What does your company look like? Yeah, I've actually been thinking a lot about this recently to share something personal. My wife is is pregnant right now with our, our first child. So thinking a lot about what the next 18 months mm -hmm. are, are going to be looking like. Um, to answer this question, I, I'd like to answer what 18 months ago looked like, because uh, I think that is, is what has changed a lot in the industry. So 18 months ago, it was very, very easy for us to book people onto podcasts because there was not a huge influx of people trying to do this. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I talk to a lot of different podcast hosts on a weekly basis to network with them and understand what they're looking for in terms of guests. And they all tell me, we're overwhelmed with guest suggestions. There's mm. too many people reaching out to us. Mm. Like I, the number one thing I hear from people is I have a part-time job reviewing guest suggestions. And this is on top of my part-time job that I have <laughs> of hosting the podcast. <laughs> and that's so that's changed a lot for mm -hmm. us in the past, you know, year and a half, I would say, and that it's much more difficult for us to, you know, actually generate the opportunities to begin with. We're still doing it because we we're doing it by, you know, creating relationships with people mm -hmm. rather than simply being an, an outbound company. I think it's going to continue to get more difficult. I saw an industry report just this week that said there are 17 guests for 17 guests looking to be placed for every show that's looking for guests. So wow. it's a huge imbalance, mm -hmm. right? So I think where our company is going to be in 18 years, 18 years, <laughs> 18 months, uh, is actually going to be much more focused on serving hosts, but not necessarily serving hosts by providing services to them, but serving hosts in an effort to make it easier to place our guests. Mm. Uh, so I don't know exactly what this means yet. And I may be, you know, thinking out loud and a little bit building in public here. Cause it's, I haven't even talked to my team about any of this yet. <laughs> um, I'm building that plane in the air. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> but it's, I've been brainstorming a lot about this just over the past week in that I believe that a lot of the future for us is going to be in, in supporting hosts and their mm. efforts of, of growing their shows. Uh, and you know, a bit of a reciprocal process. And, you yeah. know, we're going to be providing guests to them, helping to promote these these episodes to bring more traffic to them. Uh, there may be, you know, services that we're offering to the, you know, the creation side, the, the host mm -hmm. side uh, by that point. But I, I feel like there's a real opportunity here to really increase what we're able to do for our customers on the guest side by appealing more to the senses of what the hosts want to do. Because 
in essence, at the end of the day, what we are doing is we're running a two-sided marketplace where yep. we only get paid by one side. Right. And where the demand right. is heavily outweighed on one side than, mm-hmm. than the other. So we need to focus in a little bit of a non-balanced way to create that balance for us. But it's it's interesting. I mean, it, the, the gear started spinning when you were you were talking about that. I so yes, it is a two-sided marketplace, but in essence, you are serving the interests of of one for the most part. So you're serving the interests of your client to get them booked on on podcasts. But it's interesting how I, I had never really thought about it this way that there's there is almost a missing middle piece that is the facilitator of of truly the facilitator of those two sides. So how do you how do you curate opportunities and how do you curate people to fit those opportunities instead of just kind of saying I am working on behalf of the guest to get them booked on podcast. Where is that where's that actual neutral you know DMZ that middle ground that says, you know, this is ex- this is really where you know, the rubber meets the road, so to speak. So I, yeah, I, I would encourage you to, to really kind of drill into that. And I mean, I can see there's a, there's, there's a little slight gap, you know, in that yeah. particular thing. Well, it's, it's really interesting what you just said, because I believed it fully for a while until I was presented with an alternate idea, which is, you know, you said, yeah, it's a two-sided marketplace, but really you're serving one side of the marketplace. But actually, I disagree. Mm-hmm. Someone said to me, also at a mastermind one day, the hosts are your customers. And it made me go, wait. But they don't pay us. It doesn't matter. They're still your customers. You still need to keep them happy. You still need to work with them and, and service them and fulfill them in order to provide your service to the other side. Right. And it wasn't until that I started to consider the hosts as being my customers that it all got a lot easier. I was very frustrated yeah. at that point. The question that I was asking in this mastermind was, you know, hey, it used to be very easy for us to be able to make connections with hosts and get our customers book. It's been getting a lot, lot harder mm-hmm. recently. And people started drilling down with me and asking questions. Well, how are you going about this? How are you, you know, how are you treating them? Are you actually treating them as partners or, you know, which isn't to say that we are just treating them horribly <laughs> or anything. Right. It was just, exactly. you know, it was a little bit more transactional back then is, is the way to describe it. And as I started to explain how we go about it, it became very clear that when someone said, your hosts are your customers and you're just not realizing it yet. That's when everything changed and it became very simple for us to get better results for our customers because we actually started, you know, we're very good at, at outreach. We're very good at, you know, setting up calls with Mm -hmm. potential prospects and and things like that. I would have confirmed that. It wasn't until we started treating hosts as, you know, potential quote unquote sales targets with nothing to actually sell to them that everything changed. And we actually Mm -hmm. started to realize that, Hey, we're running a two-sided marketplace here and we need to manage inventory on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, I mean, we can, we can, um, I I think it's a little bit semantics and how we were kind of approaching that because exact, I I agree wholeheartedly. You are serving your hosts. There's no doubt about it. I'm, I, maybe I was just thinking about weighing the interests of, Mm -hmm. you know, who you're working with for, you know, whatever, but um, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, a year, year and a half into my podcast, I mean, I, I just virtually had to, I didn't have to reach out to anybody anymore. I mean, literally that we just started all this talk about inbound. I mean, it was inbound guest suggestions and now we get to be, you know, cherry pick and pick just the guests that, that fit the, you know, our DNA and our ethos the best, but um, invaluable services. I mean, great services and, and valuable to podcasts, you know, so there is a value there that, that we, you know, kind of receive for the most part, you know, for, for no financial, you know, outlay. But um, I still think there's something there about almost moving to a more neutral, you know, maybe neutral posture or whatever. I don't, I, and it's early days. So, I mean, it, it's just, when you were talking, I'm just thinking, I never, really never thought about that, but there's, there might be something, you know, there as they're making this transition to differentiate yourself from, you know, other booking services type thing. But uh, you guys provide such a quality service and your, your, you know, that your, your reps that reach out to me are so, you know, they're knowledgeable, 
and they're gracious and they're very responsive. You know, when I need when I need an answer, when I need more information or whatever, they're very quick to quick to jump in and and troubleshoot as well. So, um, I mean, you're you're leading by quality, you know, in this industry, and it's that's one of the reasons that I wanted you to to actually come on and and kind of share some backstory about this, but. Uh, it's, I mean, there's so many things that we could, we could drill down on so many questions we could have, but I, I really want to leave our, our, our listeners with a couple of nuggets here at the end. And then I'm going to wrap up with just letting you, you know, share anything that we haven't touched on, but what are, what are one or two things, just kind of generic things that you've learned by leading this company, regardless of what the industry is that you wish you would have known when you first started that you think would be helpful to, to people that are trying to, to get something roll into they're getting dogged in a mastermind for not having a business. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, I'll get a little bit vulnerably here and, and share that we went through a really tough period at one point with the company. And it was actually because we were so good at selling our service. And it was a little bit of a weird situation for us where we had been selling, 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 selling. And we sell for a lot of things upfront. Mm -hmm. And we were oftentimes in many months way, way overselling what we could ever fulfill because mm -hmm. we're really good at generating leads. And, you know, it was once we ramped up the sales team to be like an actual proper sales team and seeing what they could do and how much we could scale it, yeah. that it was, you know, it was hard to turn down those, those sales, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and for a while it ended up in a situation where we, you know, uh, we were, we've always been cash flow positive, but there were some times where we took some real losses on the, the P and L to, mm -hmm. you know, cause the way that we realize revenue, if you pay us up front for a certain number of bookings, we're going to defer all that revenue until we actually make the booking. And mm -hmm. that's when we're going to realize it on our P and L. And so it just, it ended up in a situation where we were unable to sell our way out because more sales were hurting the situation by, yeah. you know, we had a work that we owed, but we needed to continue to, to sell. So I always, you know, I, I hear a lot of different uh, pieces of advice. Always charge recurring. Always charge up front. Never do project base. Always do project base. You know, everyone has a different mm -hmm. take on on what you should do, right? But I mean, in general, saying charge up front is a good piece of advice. Get the money up front. It's definitely a better piece of advice than get the money yeah. afterwards. <laughs> yeah, and have to chase uh, it. Yeah, yeah, but. It really got us in some trouble, and it wasn't exactly that we were taking the money up front. Is that we just we weren't paying enough attention to that side of things to the mm. i guess inventory as a service company which isn't usually a thing for most service companies but uh yeah it, it got a little lopsided for us so that was one thing that i never would have expected to happen mm -hmm. that you know hey selling all these people up front and keeping the money is gonna hurt us a lot in the long term and we're not going to be able to sell our way out of this that makes perfect sense to me now yeah. it seems kind of dumb as i say it out loud but in the time, it it caught me with my pants down, right. for sure. <laughs> but you you wouldn't have known that coming in. I mean, it, it's such a it's unique to you know this this type of business. So, what's what's one other thing that uh, that comes to mind that you think would be helpful? Um, another challenge that we had is when we uh, I'm sure you're familiar with GDPR, mm -hmm. and when GDPR first hit, I was actually living in the EU at the time, which just added insult to injury that I had to be <laughs> physically in it, not just digitally in it. Exactly. And having run a, a cold email company, I didn't think it was going to really affect us because we didn't have too many customers in the EU and everything just started to go to spam overnight. Mm. And it was really an algorithm thing because, you know, they changed the algorithms in preparation for GDPR. All of a sudden I'm getting Viagra emails to my inbox and everything <laughs> that we're sending to our clients, which we'd never spent any time focused on deliverability or staying out of spam because we weren't sending spam. We were mm -hmm. sending highly personalized targeted emails to people. Anyways, this almost resulted in us being unable to provide anything to our customers because, you know, nothing was going through. And at this point we were not charging up front. We were charging on performance for everything that we were doing. And yeah. it actually kind of led into my decision with the new company of like, let's start charging, you know, for things mm -hmm. up front. And so anyways, I was trying to hire people and it really wasn't until we just switched to LinkedIn 
that really helped us to get out of this. And I think the takeaway for me, which I've used to apply in so many other areas of my life is that sometimes things just suck and are hard and the best decision is not to try to fix it and just do something completely different. Mm. And it's not always the answer yep. <laughs> that can yep. get you in some trouble too. Uh, but I wasn't even considering that at the time when I was so stuck in it and it delayed our switch over to LinkedIn, which was a good switch for mm -hmm. us temporarily uh, by a little bit longer than it needed to. So nowadays when I'm presented with a big challenge like that, I always try to look at it in the lens of, am I making the right decision by trying to fix this and make it work? Or should I just throw it in the trash and move on to something completely different yeah. and start fresh from there? I, I love that. And that, that is, that is what we talked really early in the, the podcast about pivoting positively. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it is, you know, the necessity is the, is the mother of invention. So, you know, it's like, how do you, you, you were, you were forced to do something either, you know, fish or cut bait, you know, type mm -hmm. thing. So I, I, and that, that is so true of, of anything that you're doing, you know, when you're faced with these obstacles. I mean, some people just think, think it's their divine calling to just power through whatever the obstacle is. And, and it may be the absolute worst thing to do, you know, or they think on, that they get the like extra of. credit points for having worked so hard at it. <laughs> exactly. That's right. I get, I get hustle style points, you know, for doing it, but, and they, we have, we covered so much ground in a pretty short period of time, but uh, is there anything that, that I just haven't asked you about that you think is, is would just be really good to close with and, and maybe just tell people where the best place to find you online and and the services you guys provide. Yeah. Uh, so people can find us online at uh, legendarypodcast.com slash guest. Uh, over there, you'll find a whole lot of resources that you can use for your, your guest podcasting journey. Another tip that I can always give people is when you're doing a podcast, the host at the end of the show is always going to ask you, how can people get in touch with you? This is your time to shine. Yeah. Most people will waste this opportunity and say, hey, go find me on LinkedIn. Here's a tip. An introvert will never go find you on LinkedIn and reach out to you. That's not how they operate. Uh, so I always recommend for people to have something prepared that's easy to remember with a URL slug that's, you know, very simple and helps them to build upon some of the things that you've talked about on that show today. This allows them to continue to gain more value out of you. And it allows you to potentially be able to continue marketing to people if they sign up and, and opt in for whatever you have for them to continue learning from. So that's the one I tend to use for people. Uh, I recommend everybody to do this when they go on a podcast because you're providing free value to others as well as making it easy to you know, actually stay in touch. Mm -hmm. Don't that's send great. people to your LinkedIn and don't send them to the homepage. They won't know what to do when they get there. So legendarypodcast.com is, is, is the best place to find out more information and uh, Dana, just thanks again for just taking time today to sharing the story behind, you know, your your many pivots you've made to to land where you are today. And um, in a unique way, I want to thank you for you and your service for really just playing your part and helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Dana, have a great afternoon. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin. I hope you heard some great takeaways from our guests today. Make sure you reach out to them and thank you again for playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide.